Welcome to Brain in a Vat. Today we're going to be looking back at some of our favorite thought experiments over the last year, starting with our first one ever. You're a train driver, you're sitting in a train, and the train's chugging along, and you see in the distance that there are five people tied to the track. So if you keep going on this track, you're going to hit those five people, and presumably they're all going to die. But there's a switch. Just in time, there's a switch, and you can switch lanes. But if you switch lanes, there's one person tied to that track. So if you switch lanes, you're going to kill that person. Question is, should you flick the switch? Should you switch to the lane with one person and kill that person instead of the five? So I gather a lot of people have this strong intuition that we should um, save as many lives as possible uh, and that therefore it's a very simple choice. We hit the switch um, and instead of five innocent people dying, only one innocent person dies. So the problem with flicking the switch is that some people say, well, whoa, you know, uh, you, you're actively killing someone if you, if you flick the switch. Uh, you know, if you don't flick the switch, you know, what happens is what happens. But if you flick the switch, you're actively killing someone. You can't do that. Now, imagine it's not flicking the switch anymore, but imagine you're not on the train, you're on a bridge above the train. And there's a man next to you and you can push that man. Imagine he's a fat man, right? So you can push this fat man off the bridge and he'll block the train and the train will derail and save everyone. What, the five people further down the track won't be hit. The, tra the train won't hit them. But the, but the fat man that you push off the bridge will die. Question is, should you push the fat man off the bridge? And now people start to get a little bit more uncomfortable. You wake up and a hospital bed and you are covered head to toe in bandages and you've got a very severe case of amnesia so much so that you don't remember your name you don't remember uh, your age even what sex you are or your race or your religion but you have some basic understanding of human psychology and of, of economics so you're lying in bed sort of you know trying to piece the world together and a doctor walks into the room and he says i'm going to give you a once in a lifetime opportunity Oh, what's that? He says, I'm going to let you design the rules for the world that you step into. So you can basically design what um, the democratic system looks like, whether it's democratic or authoritarian, um, what laws will apply to everybody. Um, but bear in mind this sort of veil of ignorance that you have, these bandages over you. So there's certain things you don't know about yourself. So for example, um, you might not want to design a society in which uh, men will be treated much better than women because you might be a woman. You might not want to design a society that was incredibly racist uh, because you might be in the disfavored race or one that persecutes religious minorities um, because you, don't, you might be in that minority group. So the idea is that you're going to be incentivized through a process of rationality to pick certain kinds of principles. And the first principle that we're going to pick is this one of um, everyone having a basic set of equal rights. All right, so one of the things that I've been thinking about is the moral status of artificial uh, intelligences. And you can find a lot of people who don't have any problems with the idea that there might be intelligent machines and think perhaps that in the not too distant future, we will encounter intelligent machines. And I like to ask, um, you know, what would, what would it be like if that were true? And in particular, do these people really believe what they say? And so the way I think about that is to imagine a situation where someone tells you uh, that your mobile phone has a sentient artificial intelligence in it. It's like the next generation of Siri. It can pass the cheering test. It can read you poetry. It can converse naturally. And people will say, look, in this little box you have, there is a sentience, there is a mind. And in a, you know, a moment of frustration, you throw that in the bath and you fry it completely. It's not waterproof and that mind, that entity is completely destroyed when you throw it in the bath. And the question I like to ask then is, would you convict that person of murder? And I, I call this the Turing triage test. Uh, it's a modelled on the Turing test, uh, the original Turing test, which was supposed to help us uh, answer the question, when can machines think? And the answer was when they can uh, converse with us in such a way that we can't tell that they're not human. 
And I, I think we should approach the question, when will machines have moral standing? When will they uh, be the sorts of things that we owe duties to? When we would convict someone of murder uh, when they destroyed uh, what is purportedly a sentient machine? And then I think, actually, it's very hard to believe that. It's very hard to believe uh, that someone should be, for instance, crippled by guilt and remorse uh, for destroying this thing that looks like your mobile phone. Suppose it turned out <clears throat> that uh, the only realistic way uh, to get through the pandemic was through something like infection-acquired herd immunity. Just enough people uh, get infected and therefore enough people are immune that the uh, uh, spread of the disease kind of peters out, right? Um, uh, and, you know, you're not going to be able, I mean, suppose it would take several years to get a vaccine or something like that, then uh, you're not going to be able to have lockdowns for that entire time. So at some point, you're just going to have to, maybe you'll have kind of intermittent lockdowns, or maybe uh, you'll do something like what the U.S. has done now and just give up and kind of let it spread or whatever. Um, and in a situation like that, in a situation where the way out is through uh, acquired herd immunity, um, the question is, uh, is it better to just let the disease naturally infect people? Or would it be better to uh, implement what's called controlled voluntary infection? Um, so uh, you would go, you would give, you know, some, some form of informed consent, whatever the standards for that are. Um, the doctor would intentionally give you uh, some COVID uh, with the aim of, uh, you getting infected, hopefully becoming immune afterwards, right? Uh, we would do this for people who were at comparatively low risk, so you have a better chance of survival. Why would you do this? Well, it might be good kind of on the social level. Uh, it could help you end the pandemic sooner, reach herd immunity faster. Um, it might sort of even out the infection curve if you did this during off-peak times when the medical system isn't overwhelmed. Um, it can ensure that the people who get infected uh, in order to reach the herd immunity threshold are people who are less likely to have severe complications. So that would be good uh, on the societal level. It also might be good for you as an individual. Um, you might be uh, exempted from lockdowns. You might be, so I, I live with my elderly landlord. If you did this and then could stay somewhere else until after you had uh, recovered, then you would know that you weren't going to infect these other people who are vulnerable around you. Uh, you would know when you got infected, so you would know what to look for. You could get medical treatment right away, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, in a situation uh, like this, it might be, um, uh, socially good uh, to offer controlled voluntary infection. It might also be good for the individual, at least for some individuals, to go and get voluntarily infected, depending on how risk sensitive they are and so on. Um, and yet a lot of people think that this idea just seems sort of ethically off the wall. Um, there's got to be something wrong with it. Um, so the question is, uh, I guess, uh, would it make sense for you as an individual to go and get voluntarily infected and would it make sense for doctors to offer this, for a government to have a policy of promoting this, etc.? Uh, many of your viewers and listeners may be familiar with the myth of Sisyphus. Uh, Sisyphus was doomed by the gods, punished by the gods by being forced to roll a rock up a hill and when it got to the top it would just roll down again and he would have to roll it up again, and he was uh, doomed to do this for the rest of eternity. Uh, this myth makes its way into uh, one of the works in contemporary philosophy about the meaning of life. It's a paper by Richard Taylor. And towards uh, the end, I think it is, of that paper, he imagines a twist in that story. Because Sisyphus's life looks like a completely meaningless one. His, his fate he seems to be doomed to pointlessness, just endless rolling of this rock up the hill. And what Richard Taylor does is imagine a scenario in which the gods alleviated his condition to some extent by implanting in him a compulsive desire, or just a desire of a regular kind, to endlessly roll rocks. And the question is, what that would do to his predicament? Would it relieve it entirely? Uh, would it mitigate it only somewhat? Imagine that you're traveling to a new kingdom. So you're coming down the hills into a valley. And the reputation of the kingdom is that it's ruled by a benevolent, wise and powerful 
King, who ensures that it's a wonderful place. As you're coming down the hills, you can see this, the, the, the kingdom. It's not a huge kingdom, but you can see it spread out before you. And fr from a distance, it looks glorious. Um, green rolling fields, nice cities um, shining in the sun and so on. And so you're filled with expectation as you cross the border into the kingdom. You walk on a little bit and to your horror, you notice that there are bodies hanging from the lampposts. Men, women, children lining the route that you're taking. And so you reconsider. It doesn't seem like it can be true that the kingdom's ruled by a powerful, wise and benevolent ruler. Perhaps this is an outlying area. Perhaps he doesn't know. Perhaps he's not well informed in the suitable sense. He's not, he's not wise the way that he was reported to be. Perhaps he's not powerful. Perhaps he knows about the bodies. He knows about the killing, but there's nothing that he can do to prevent it. So maybe he's actually not powerful. Maybe he knows about the bodies and he could prevent the killings, but he doesn't, in which case, presumably we're going to conclude that he's not so good. Maybe he's morally indifferent, he doesn't care. Maybe actually he's enthusiastic. Maybe he's behind the killings. What we're not going to do as we continue walking into the, into the kingdom, if we don't run away immediately, is that it's clearly not under the control of a ruler who's all three of powerful, wise, well-informed and good. Suppose that your brother goes missing. He's been missing for a while and you get more and more evidence that he's dead. Because of this evidence, you believe and you think it's pretty likely that he's dead. But you think, look, there's some chance that he might be alive. And it would be really, really good if he were alive and I found him. And because there's that chance that he's alive and it would be really good if he was alive, you continue to act as if he's alive. You put up missing posters, you spend time searching for him, etc. And the goodness of sort of being able to find him, this possibility, motivates you to do this, even though you think it's pretty unlikely that he's alive. So what I think is interesting about this thought experiment is that it shows that, at least in certain cases, what you should believe and how you should act can come apart. So in this case, uh, you should believe that your brother is dead, or at least think it's very likely that he's dead, but it's still rational for you to act as if he's alive because how, of how high the stakes are, because there's a potentially really good outcome you could get if he is alive. And I think this is really interesting because part of what it shows is that having a lot of evidence for something isn't the only thing that justifies us in acting as if that thing's true, but also sort of what we desire or what's at stake that also plays a big part in justifying um, how we should act. So imagine you say, I believe that my soulmate is out there. I believe that there is the perfect man in my life. And if I met him, I would have the best of all possible relationships. And so I, you know, I don't know it. I have some level of, of credence in this account and I'm going to act as if that person is there. And when you meet someone that is clearly not perfect, you end the relationship. And so you keep saying no to all these sort of sub-perfect relationships, and then you die a spinster, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> you could say you had the wrong attitude towards romantic love. You know, you could have picked, you know, a, a life that was suboptimal where you were with a few Mr. Mr. Rights or right issues. Um, you never found your soulmate, but that was better than dying alone. And that might be the sort of parallel with the God case, which is you mm -hmm. had all your hopes pinned on the sort of perfect eternal being, Turns out there is no Mr. Right, there is no Mr. Eternal Being, and you missed out on your life, and that was the only chance you had. I like thought experiments that come from that come from real life. So this is actually a, this is a story that really happened. I, I knew some people in Yorkshire, some some good friends of mine, who and some other people who were uh, visiting from, stu visiting students from from China. Well, one evening the Chinese students invited over these these two uh, Yorkshire students for a home cooked Chinese meal. And the, the two students from Yorkshire went over and they were served a delicious meal, which they ate. And it was so delicious, they ate everything on their plate. And in fact, 
in Yorkshire, at least maybe all of England, I don't know, but the, the rule is that you should not leave anything left on your, you shouldn't leave anything on your plate. It would be a sign to your host that you didn't, uh, that you didn't like the food enough to eat it all. So they ate everything and they thought that was the whole meal, but then their Chinese hosts went into the kitchen and started making up more food and bringing that out. So, and this went on for some time. They kept eating all the food on their plate and they thought this is delicious food, but is there, <laughs> is this going to go on uh, forever? And at a certain point, they just had to say that they couldn't eat any more food and it was a bit uncomfortable on both sides. They didn't realize until later on, in fact, none of them realized that there was a, an interesting culture clash going on there that it turns out that in, in China, they have exactly the opposite rules. In China, if, you, if, you, if you're a guest at, at someone's home, you show that the person has taken care of you hospitably by not eating everything on the plate. You leave a bit left over as if to say, you've, you've served me so, so well, so generously, that I can't even eat everything you've, you've offered me. And conversely, if somebody is, so, so if, if you're Chinese and somebody um, comes over and eats everything on the plate, it's a sign that the person must have been starving and, and you, you didn't do, do a good enough job, so then you have to go and, and, and get some more food. Now, the interesting thing about this is that both of these systems of ethics are completely consistent within themselves. You know, there's, there's nothing, if, if everybody is, understands what the rule is and follows that rule, everything works out fine. The problem is what happens when the two cultures come into, into contact and then, and then there's this conflict. Now, here's the, here's the relativism question. If, if, if we want to say, you know, what's, what was the right thing to do in that situation? It might be tempting to ask that, but we can probably see that that doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not, like, it's not as though the, the, um, the Yorkshire people had it wrong and the Chinese people had it right, or vice versa. There is no right or wrong objectively. There's just what's right for Yorkshire and what's right for, for China, and that's it. And this, this, this also applies to many other things, like, for example, which side of the road we, we, we drive on. I think there in South Africa, you drive on the left side of the road. Uh, right. And I'm a, I'm a Canadian now living in the States, and in both those countries, we drive on the right. Uh, now, if, if you came over here and were driving on the left side of the road, you would cause all kinds of, <laughs> of accidents, and you'd be doing the wrong thing, just as I would if I went there and drove on the right. But again, there's no objective answer to the question, who is right? Well, there's the right thing to do in South Africa, and there's the right thing to do in New Jersey, where I am, and that's it. So, mor so moral relativism is the view that this kind of thinking applies to all cases of morals, that there's never anything that's objectively right or wrong to do. What's right or wrong is just, it just depends completely on what culture or, or country you happen to be a part of. Uh, the story uh, is true, it happened a number of years ago. I was uh, in South Africa and I was uh, visiting a, a friend. Uh, there were a bunch of philosophers and other academics there as well. Uh, what, one person at this party came up to me and uh, asked what I did, and I told them what I did. I, I taught a course in the philosophy of religion. And he became very excited and thought this was very interesting and actually invited me to uh, perhaps present on some of my views uh, at an upcoming conference that he was hosting. I was very excited about this, so of, of course I continued to talk to him and try to get to know uh, who he was and what he was like and so on. Uh, eventually, we, we did broach the subject of what it was that I did. Uh, so you asked me, Sean, what area of Indian philosophy of religion do you uh, lecture? I was a bit taken aback because I didn't lecture anything in uh, Indian philosophy of religion. I rather lectured in analytic philosophy. And so I, I let him know that, you know, and sadly he'd been mistaken. I, I actually I was uh, not Indian myself and did not lecture in Indian philosophy. And he was, of course, a little bit shocked, a little bit surprised. And in ways that perhaps were a bit more awkward, but unavoidable, he rescinded his invitation to me. And I thought that this was quite an interesting way for us to start out our discussion uh, about race, uh, and in particular, what sort of things races are and whether or not races are real. You see, in this case, this man had seen me, he'd seen the complexion of my skin, uh, the presence of a beard, and had assumed that I must be of Indian heritage or Indian descent. In other words, he'd assumed that I should be objectively categorized as an Indian person. Um, and he also assumed, moreover, that as an Indian person, I had certain views, certain values, and would behave in certain sorts of ways. Uh, perhaps that I would be interested in teaching and studying the philosophy of Indian religion. Um, so a question that we may ask is, is he correct to do this? Are there objective ways in which people fall into races? Uh, or is it more of a matter of social convention? in a phrase, 
do races really exist and what sorts of things are they? Among other things, I'm a senior editor at Tablet Magazine, which is a, a Jewish uh, arts and culture publication. Uh, it's on the web at tabletmag.com. And they're the ones who sponsor the podcast. I'm so proud to host Unorthodox. A number of years ago, I wrote a piece for Tablet. Back then, it was called Next Book. It was at nextbook.org. But I think the archives have poured it over to Tablet. And I wanted to go interview... Um, American white supremacists or neo-Nazis. No, no, no. The way I phrased it was I wanted to interview Holocaust deniers. And I forget how I came to these two, but one was named Mark Weber. He runs something called the Institute for Historical Review, which is a major Holocaust denial publishing house. I mean, it's major within the small world and, and small print run of Holocaust denial publishing. It's not major, major, but it's major in that little small twisted little world. And then another guy was um, Bradley, I think it was Bradley Smith, who was... Um, Somewhat famous in the, in, the, in the 80s, I think, he took out ads in campus publications offering lots of money to anyone who could prove that somebody had ever died in a gas chamber or something. He was, he was a provocateur, a, campus, a Holocaust denial campus provocateur. And Mark Weber lived in greater Los Angeles in Southern California. And Bradley, again, I want to say Smith, but we can check. This is what Google is for, um, lived right across the border in Mexico. And so I realized if I got a plane ticket to LA, I could interview two of the most notorious Holocaust deniers uh, currently practicing uh, their trade in America. And I did, and I wrote a four-part piece. Um, I think it's the headlines, The Denial Twist. You can all go look it up. In which I basically interviewed both of them. I went out to Southern California and spent you know, a few hours with one and a few hours with the other. And um, of course, it had all these amazing twists and turns, which are that Bradley uh, had an ex-wife or common-law wife, I don't know if they were ever formally married, who was, of course, Jewish. And Mark Weber's sister had converted to Judaism. And like these people were completely like surrounded by Yids wherever they, wherever they looked and had like pretty good relations. You know, again, like one of them had been married to one, the other one, well, I think his sister and he had some tensions between them. But, um, you know, unsurprisingly, right, that unsurprisingly, the flip side of, of, of obsession with Jews is a kind of like obsession with Jews, right? That these aren't people who don't care about Jews. These are actually people who care deeply about Jews. The English novelist Howard Jacobson has a great piece in which he talks about the sad plight of the Holocaust denier who's always sitting in his library surrounded by the Talmud and Torah and, you know, works of Holocaust history, who's basically made a life of scholarship about um, gas chambers and, and Talmud and Maimonides in his de twisted desire to prove that the Jews are the root of all evil. He knows Judaism better than most completely secularized Jews do, right? So that is one of the irony about really committed anti-Semites is they're so interested in Jews. Um, and so I wrote this piece and it ran and um, this was pre-Twitter and you know we might have gotten some mail, but certainly if it ran today, we would have gotten a lot of abuse for giving a, a platform to these Holocaust deniers. And my piece was I'm sure there was some snark in it. I think it was probably clear that I'm not a Holocaust denier and I thought these men were wrong, but it gave a long, long, it gave a lot of space to them. Um, much as Tablet recently ran a long interview with Kevin MacDonald, who's this psychologist who has all sorts of Jewish genetic theories that are really troubling and offensive. And, you know, my view about this stuff, my interest in free speech as a journalist is always that the job of the journalist is to tell people stuff they want to know, right? It's very basic. It's very like, this is, this is a privilege. You know, a lot of people have to work in backbreaking labor in the mines. A lot of people are waiting tables for minimum wage. A lot of people are unemployed. And here I get to uh, get up in the morning and call people and ask intrusive questions. And sometimes I get to take a plane to meet them and sit and have conversation. That to me is this, and then I, and then the only ask is that I, in a fair, um, conscientious way, report back to other people about it because those other people are waiting tables or working in mines or farming or working as accountants or doing all sorts of meaningful labor, but they don't get to do the thing I do, which is have these conversations. So my job, if I go to the scene of something or interview someone, is to tell them the thing they want to know. And a lot of people want to know what's going on in the heads of Holocaust deniers, racists, bigots, um, you know, of the right and the left, Fidel Castro apologists, you name it, right? Chavez apologists. And, you know, the New York Times ran a piece, I want to say three, four years ago, sometime right after Trump was elected, in which they interviewed somebody who was 
I think he was a white nationalist. I, th- I don't remember the piece terribly well, but he was, he was pretty racist. He wasn't just right winger. He was definitely over the line into white nationalist, white supremacist. But he was the, this kind of average everyday schmo who led a normal life and coached Little League and had a wife and family and probably had some people of color who were his friends, but he had these horrible beliefs. And the Times ran the story straight, just like here he is without any judgment, just here's a look inside this person's life. And there was all this criticism. How dare you give him a platform? How dare you don't signal your disapproval in the pros? And I thought, wait a second, this was a terrific piece because the job is to go and report back to people about the way we live now, about life. And, um, you know, that doesn't necessarily imply one position or another when it comes to, you know, some of the things that are illegal in some parts of the world, you know, hate speech, Holocaust denial, et cetera. Um, And I'm happy to talk about those things. But when I hear free speech, I think about the fact that I went out there and I sat with Holocaust deniers and I wasn't, you know, I mean, I will sometimes talk to people who talk about how traumatic it is to have to encounter certain views and say, look, I'm a Jewish guy who literally went and sat at like a burrito place with America's leading Holocaust denier. Um, and I, I emerged unscathed. I mean, it was, it was unpleasant. And obviously I signed up for this work. Not everyone does. But if you have the privilege of living in a liberal democracy where mostly you're free from uh, violence and where there aren't warring factions who might pull you in, who might turn your children into child soldiers. I mean, when you think of the grand scheme of things, I'm lucky enough that I can, that those of us in America right now, even in these tough times, have, should be, have a capacious enough sensibility to say, we would prefer to know stuff rather than to be protected from it. So that's, that's what I think about. So suppose you're charged with uh, appointing a, a justice to the Supreme Court. And in the United States, understand the Supreme Court has only nine members. I gather your constitutional court has 11 members, so a little bit bigger. So you have to appoint one justice to the court. You have, let's say, three or four finalist candidates. And these are all very distinguished and accomplished lawyers. Um, Some of them have already served on lower courts. Some have tremendous practice experience. They've argued before the Supreme Court. Uh, One of them maybe is even a law professor in addition to having argued before the court. Um, They have uh, uh, very good reputations in the professional community. They all get the highest rating from the American Bar Association, which evaluates candidates in terms of their competence and, and skill. Um, and they all have excellent educational backgrounds. They all went to Chicago or to Harvard um, or other major American law schools. And then the question is, uh, how do you choose among them? And one possibility is that you might want to get some more information about, well, who has argued before the Supreme Court more, right? Or who has had more experience as a judge or who has had more experience as a lawyer or more diverse kinds of experience representing say corporations and individuals, right? You might want to uh, approach it that way. Um, And my claim is, is that that wouldn't allow you to make an informed decision about who should be on the Supreme Court. That no matter how much you know about their legal experience, their skills, their talents, the kind of legal work they've done, right? What other professionals think of them, you still won't know what you really need to know in appointing a justice to the Supreme Court. 